the five lessons I've learned that work equally well for islands and software. Uh, Governor's Island uh, is an island off uh, the coast of Manhattan. Uh, it's a former military base. It was an abandoned military base. Uh, it had basically been off limits to uh, the city of New York, uh, literally open one day a year uh, until 2003, uh, when it was sold by the federal government to the city and the state. Uh, and you can see from this uh, visual, uh, it's filled with buildings, uh, some historic, uh, a number of them on the southern half of the island, which we refer to as the ice cream cone, the sort of cone half of the island, clearly non-historic. Uh, and uh, as I'll talk about, a uh, lot of questions uh, and interest in what will happen with the island. So I'll talk a little bit about my strategy. But if you hadn't heard of it before, um, one of the, earlier this week, uh, the city and state announced that the mayor would take over the island, uh, and we released the master plan, uh, which Nikolai Orosov re reviewed in the Times. So we will not quiz anyone at lunch uh, about those things. Um, but I also worked at this little software company in Seattle called Microsoft. Uh, and so I actually think of what I do on the island is very similar to what I did at Microsoft. I do confess that um, I had nothing to do with Windows Vista uh, because I worked at Microsoft so long ago that the box that I worked on is probably in the Microsoft uh, Museum, of which apparently there is one right now. Um, but uh, in any event, this gives you the idea. Um, so lesson number one is, seems really obvious. Listen and ask the right questions. So when you go to Amazon and you look up books on listening, there's all these relationship books. And there's almost no books sort of in the business category. And one of the things I find, and I was, of course, in marketing at Microsoft, um, which sort of guided me through the rest of my career, is that people actually don't listen, especially people in marketing and sales. Your, people are so interested in telling me how great the product is. They don't even watch the body language of the people who are sitting across from them. Um, and they also don't ask the right questions. So when I first started at Microsoft, I didn't actually know how to use a computer. And this is back in 1989. And so I started to use Microsoft Word. Now, uh, this is actually before Windows. And I said, this seems really hard to use. And one of my colleagues said, uh, user error. And I said, I hate to break it to you, but the users look a lot more like me than they do like you. And of course, I was right. And it took us two more versions, certainly the launch of Windows, uh, to penetrate the market. I was there again, and I'll use the word primordial again, uh, when we had 5% market share. Um, but they weren't really listening to the users because they were dismissing people like me as being incompetent. Um, I also took over a product, little product called Microsoft Money. And one of the first things I did was drop the price to $10. And there was just sort of bedlam in the PR department. How can you do this? This means it's worth nothing. And I said, well, it is worth nothing. Nobody should buy this product. And if I go out to the press and say, you know, this is a great product. It's as good as Quicken, I'm going to have no credibility. Um, we then went and completely redesigned the product. Actually, Microsoft canceled the product recently. So I wouldn't say that it was ultimately a successful strategy, but that's a long, longer story. But in all seriousness, I knew that I, I was listening to people, and they were saying, it is an inadequate product. So why were we charging the same as the competitor? It just didn't make any sense. I couldn't persuade someone to do that. But the other really important thing is to ask the right questions. When I uh, got on the island, and I literally work on the island, so I took a boat to get here uh, today, um, the big question for New York City, and you'll see it on blogs even this week, is what should Governor's Island be? So I started asking, you know, I went out, talked to anybody um, who would talk to me. I was very uh, unqualified for this job because I am not an architect. I do have an MBA, but I hadn't worked in planning. I hadn't worked in real estate development. So I kind of took advantage of the fact that I was spectacularly unqualified. And I'd say, well, what do you think? And I realized after about two or three meetings like this that I was asking the wrong question. And that the right question was, what should happen first? And the whole strategy that we developed, which I'll talk about in a second, came from asking the right question. And the whole city, and you can see, I have a file drawer filled with you know, 152 ideas of what Governor's Island should be. Um, it's become a very popular uh, place on the front page of the paper this week um, because we changed what the question was. So again, I think listening you know, is something that we all, you know, when we're having fights with our partners uh, in our personal life, you're not listening to me. But the truth is, I think many of us really don't listen to what people are saying about our products. Um, or our projects, uh, and we're really not asking the right questions. So that's lesson number one. The second question, uh, really obvious. Um, I sort of went to a fake business school. I went to the Yale School of Management, uh, but I didn't learn this in business school. Um, I learned this at Microsoft. You've got to understand the customer, the product, and the market. 
Uh, we used to have this thing at Microsoft called the elevator test. Uh, and for those of you who have been to the Redmond campus, you know that most of the buildings are very uh, short. So it's a very quick elevator ride, which was if you got in an elevator with Bill Gates, how would you explain your product strategy? And uh, you were expected as a product manager, this is going back in time, but it's still true there, that you were the person who understood who the customer was, what their needs were, what the product actually did and should do, and what the market was. And again, this seems like marketing 101, but I am still stunned at how many organizations, not-for-profit organizations, certainly government agencies, and many companies don't really understand who their customer is, um, what the strengths and true weaknesses of their product are, um, and what's the larger market. So for example, when I was on the board of a museum, um, we were talking about you know, uh, the competitors, which is also a horrible word, of course, in uh, nonprofits. And I said, well, you know, one of our competitors is the movies. Oh, movies? Well, because on a Saturday afternoon, I'm going to decide whether I'm going to the movies or I'm going to a museum. That's what people do. Um, in the museum world, people only think about uh, other nonprofits. Um, this sort of premise of understanding the customer in our case for Governor's Island, ultimately our customer is our organizations that will make their home on Governor's Island. We have 172 acres, 52 vacant buildings, 33 acres reserved for development. Uh, but we quickly realized that the customer was actually the larger public, the city of New York, and that the problem was not you know, how much does it cost to renovate a building to turn it into a hotel, but that fundamentally people didn't believe that there was any reason you should do anything on an island that was not accessible by subway or taxi. And so when we understood that our customer was actually sort of the larger public and opinion leaders, uh, we actually developed our strategy. Um, and that, the, that if we had targeted that strategy to developers, we'd probably still be sitting in the same place where we were four years ago when we started asking the right questions. Um, there are countless examples of this, but I also wanted to just mention that you have to be incredibly honest about your product. Um, and this is something that um, was very hard for a number of my colleagues at Microsoft. I remember when I left the company, um, I started using, God, this, I'm so old, uh, AOL email. And I was sending, the company was trying to get me to come back to work there, and, and someone said, how can you send, like, use AOL email to send it to, like, Steve Ballmer, Jeff Riggs? I said, because it's better. You know, and if they used it, they would understand why they're not succeeding. Um, and it is incredibly important uh, for you to really think hard, who's using your products? Why are they using? Why are they using the competitor's products? Uh, what are the strengths and weaknesses? And then uh, what is the larger market? And again, seems really obvious, but it's my little outline. I can remember my first little outline of a marketing plan when I was at Microsoft. And uh, that's what I use every day when I sit in a board meeting uh, for a nonprofit or I'm sitting at work uh, on the island. Again, this seems really s simple. Develop a strategy and stick to it. But make sure your mother can understand it. Um, there's a lot of jar. I'm going to start with making sure your mother can understand it first, uh, again with uh, a high tech story, and then I'll uh, beat up on some of my colleagues in planning. Uh, I was asked to consult to MSNBC when it was started, and somebody had this you know, elaborate PowerPoint. They emailed it to me. It had all of whatever the lingo were, uh, words were back in the 90s. And I said, can you explain to me the strategy for MSNBC in words that my mother could understand? And there was dead silence. And then I was told by this person's boss that they refused to ever speak to me again. And of course, I did not get the consulting gig. And they took it as like incredibly flip. But my point was that ultimately, if not my mother, then the rest of us were going to use this product. And if we were only using the language, whatever the sort of language of our industry was at that moment, to describe what the strategy was, we were never going to develop a strategy that actually made sense. And you have to use the same words when you're talking to each other that you use with your customers, uh, the same words that humans use. Um, this is very important. Uh, one of the lingo words, uh, I worked in the school system. I ran the, created and ran an organization called the Fund for Public Schools. So one of the words uh, that people use a lot is engagement. 
parental engagement, community engagement. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever wanted to be engaged in that way, but I uh, told my group that unless somebody had a new ring on their finger, we were not allowed to use the word engagement. Um, because it's not a word that, again, we were dealing with inner city parents in the Bronx. They, you know, inner city parents in the Bronx want to know, like, who's my you know, kid's teacher? How are they going to graduate from high school? You know, and are you going to talk to me in a language, the actual language that I speak? They don't want a parental engagement counselor to speak to them um, because that's automatically distancing that institution, in the case of the school system, from their customer, who in that case were parents in the Bronx. Um, and that happens over and over again. I totally recommend that people read George Orwell on a regular basis. George Orwell is probably the most brilliant writer who talks about what words mean um, and how the use of certain words uh, distort uh, what uh, what the intention is and really obfuscate between what you're, you claim you're talking about uh, and what uh, you really mean. Um, in the world that I'm currently in, I work with a lot of architects, and architects are notorious uh, for using a lot of multisyllabic words. Uh, when, uh, we do interventions. There are moves in architecture. Um, and I have banned that language because if I can't understand it, I don't care that a gathering of architects dressed all in black, uh, which they always are, um, will, will understand it. Because ultimately, I'm selling a project called the new master plan for Governor's Island to the people and the people they elect. Because ultimately, the people who are going to pay for it um, are politicians. And politicians aren't going to pay for projects unless uh, voters want them to. Um, and I think that what happens is that, again, people uh, develop a vocabulary that is completely self-referential. And I confess um, that I bet there's a whole lot of vocabulary in this room, because, uh, again, I'm not in the high-tech world right now, um, that I don't know. But I really would ask you to ask yourselves, like, do you actually understand what it is? And is what you're doing um, mapped to human behavior uh, in ways that are comprehensible? But it's not just about how you talk about a strategy. It's that you actually have to develop a strategy. Now, here, there's a zillion books, right? So there's a zillion websites and books. Um, I uh, believe very strongly that once you've gone through the process of saying, OK, who's my customer? Do I really understand them? Do I really understand what my product is? Uh, in the case of Governor's Island, obviously, a handicapped product. It's an island, an abandoned military base, accessible only by boat. Um, but it has uh, certain extraordinary attributes, incredible views of lower Manhattan, beautiful green space. Um, and what is the market, which is the larger region? Uh, then we developed a strategy. So uh, back in 2006, uh, when I first started working on Governor's Island, uh, we issued an RFP for development on the island, and it failed. Uh, we didn't get any significant development. And then we, had, we then spent time developing a four-pronged strategy. And that strategy for the island, and uh, what I'll tell you is what I uh, say to everyone, the first is expanding visitation and early uses for the island. Because we recognized, because we had looked at our customer and our product and understood that one of the biggest challenges was the psychological barrier of convincing anyone that an island, accessible only by boat, could be relevant to New York, we knew that getting people to the island, but getting people to the island with what we call signature early uses uh, really mattered. And signature early uses, which sounds a little bit jargony, I think I probably should change it after I've used it for four years, um, is really a much more simple way of saying that would be, what can you do on the island that you can't do anywhere else? So our strategy is all about miniature golf designed by artists. Um, we have a miniature golf course designed by artists. So we'll have our third version this year. And that is actually uh, the sort of heart of our real estate development strategy, because it's about democracy. Um, it's about something unique. Uh, it's free, of course. Um, it attracts people from Williamsburg hipsters to immigrant families. Uh, the children actually usually uh, beat the adults, uh, so it's fun to watch that. Um, but what it is is it's emblematic of a whole host of experiences uh, on the island that you can't do in museums, uh, that don't take place in your neighborhood, and are not available in the public parks of New York. Um, and so the result of that first prong of our strategy has been that while we had 8,000 visitors the summer before I got there, uh, uh, we had 275,000 visitors last year in a 60-day season. So that's the first part of our strategy. The second part of our strategy is uh, what we say uh, investing in infrastructure and stabilization, uh, which is the boring part, which is you have to keep paying uh, to improve the capital of the island. The third part is mixed-use, multi-phase development, which is my way government speak for it's going to take a really long time and you better be patient. 
And the fourth is uh, developing a world-class destination park. Uh, and that's what we announced uh, earlier this week uh, with, with great acclaim. Now, the particulars of that strategy are not really of interest to you. You're not the Regional Planning Association. But the point is that that is our strategy. Every single time I talk about Governor's Island, that's what we talk about. Um, everything we do in our organization maps to that. If you go talk to a security guard on the island, if you talk to the janitor, they can repeat that strategy. They understand what, what their job, how their job matters. And let me tell you, when you run a public space, the janitor better understand your strategy because having a clean, beautiful place that welcomes visitors is part of our strategy. And what was interesting, I was uh, being interviewed by a reporter yesterday he said, well, you know, you're starting with this park, and I think this means the failure of the Bloomberg administration thing to start with development, and now you're switching, going to parks. And I said, you may want to write that article, but the truth is I have a press release from November 2006 that articulates the strategy, and we've just been doing the same thing and building and building uh, since that time. I have not heard from him since I sent him the press release uh, because I think he had to go back to the drawing board to write his article. But that relates to the fourth lesson, which is... Think big and act small. Think big, okay, visionary. I'm sure there's ideation. There's lots of these big words. You have to get shit done. And in my world, you really, uh, people don't trust government. They don't believe that we're ever going to do what we say we're going to do. And I never say that I'm going to do something that I can't get done. We have a huge vision for this island for this incredibly improbable project, 150 acres in the middle of the harbor. We have an extraordinary uh, plan uh, to create uh, hills and a totally new landscape. But let me tell you, when I said to the Brooklyn community who were very pissed at us two years ago, I said, you'll have boats next year, Governor's Island. On time, I called them up. Hi, would you like to be on the first boat? We'll move the boats, we'll have more boats next year. You know, same thing, I'm talking to them this afternoon. The boats are coming. It's incredibly important that you get stuff done. I um, think a lot of people, um, and I, I, th I think PowerPoint has contributed to this. We all come up with big words, big visions. Um, this is certainly true when I worked in a startup. Every day, get stuff done, but make sure what you're getting done actually maps to the strategy that you set out. Now, you may have to revisit your strategy, um, and it may change as the market changes, as circumstances change. But really, do not be afraid to think big. You know, I'm the one who said, don't let planning get in the way of doing, but act small. Every day, make sure that you're getting something done. Um, I don't do strategic plans. Uh, that's, a, I think, sort of the, uh, the uh, nemesis of certainly not-for-profit organizations. They make strategic plans over and over again. Uh, we have a very succinct strategy. Um, it is incredibly ambitious. It's transforming a huge piece of New York City. But every day, we act small. And every piece of garbage that we pick up, every sign that we create, every uh, hole of miniature golf is part of a larger strategy. Now, last. And I'm so happy to be here. I'm not usually allowed to use the M word because I work in government. Marketing is all. Okay? So in my world, marketing, we use the word outreach. Um, we're not allowed to say marketing because marketing sounds like business and we're selling sponsorships. Uh, but it's the same thing. In the nonprofit world, uh, people call it cultivation and development, which is a way of saying that you're hitting people up for money, which is very much like sales. Um, I had the great fortune of working in a company at a time when marketing was really considered strategic. We were the people who were responsible for the vision for the product. Every, when I took this job on Governor's Island, I called a friend and he, he kind of was skeptical about why I was taking this job. And then I got profiled in the Times and they said, hmm, it seemed like you, you knew something I didn't know. He goes, you figured out that what everyone thought was a planning job was actually a marketing job. I actually think that marketing is embedded in our DNA. And when I first started in my career, somebody said, how did you convince these people you didn't know how to use a computer to hire you? You know, I said, I just read the Marketplace page of the Wall Street Journal for two years, of sitting in the back of my business school class, um, and kind of understood that marketing was like history. Um, it was like shopping. You know, I knew how to do history. I'd major in history. I shop all the time. It is how do you understand what motivates people to do something and then how do you organize your company, your product, your vision to map what it is, um, to map that to uh, how people work and think. And so every day we are marketing Governor's Island. We are overcoming this huge credibility gap, right? This island that didn't exist on the map of New York that nobody went to. Uh, and every day it's, you know, who are we talking to in the press? How can we improve the services on the island? Um, how do we explain our strategy better? Um, because ultimately we're trying to create and sell a vision uh, to the city of New York, uh, to the region, 
Again, we only have, uh, we have two customers, the mayor and the governor, who fund us, um, but there's a lot of steps to get uh, there. And uh, in our case, um, because I work for both the city of New York and the state of New York, um, if I had sort of stuck to the normal uh, process, sort of planning and politics and bureaucracy, nothing would have gotten done. We realized that by marketing, by reaching out to the people of New York, by creating incredible experiences that people love, uh, we managed to move a very, very improbable project forward. So um, it's such a relief to be able to use the M word. Um, don't tell anyone, please, uh, because I'll get in trouble in the New York Post. Uh, but really, uh, to me, uh, marketing is all. Um, I only have five lessons because one of the lessons I learned when we used to do 45-minute demos of software was people can only remember really three things. Um, but uh, I stretched the limit with five. Um, but really, it's the same whether it's an island, whether it's Twitter, whether it's software, whether it's a bakery. Um, these are the same lessons. Um, I feel like whatever I do, whatever I do next, um, I'm using this, drawing on the same five lessons. Um, and I think that's true wherever you work or however you do your stuff. So thanks for having me. Thank you.